Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sterile Processing Department, Design and HVAC Considerations, one of 10 webinars hosted by the Facility Guidelines Institute on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. My name is Heather Livingston. I'm FGI's Director of Operations and the Managing Editor of the 2022 edition of the Guidelines, and I'm very pleased to be your moderator during today's webinar. FGI is excited to host this series of continuing education webinars developed to broaden understanding of the guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AIA credit, you will need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. Now it's my honor to introduce today's presenters. Byron Burlingame has been employed for the past 14 years as a perioperative specialist at the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses, AORN. He serves as the lead author for various guidelines, including the AORN Guideline for Design and Maintenance of the Surgical Suite. Byron also serves as an AORN representative on the Facility Guidelines Institute's Health Guidelines Revision Committee. He has authored several columns and articles published in AORN Journal and other professional publications. Prior to coming to AORN, Byron worked as a circulating RN and in management in large and rural hospitals. Paula Wright is a registered nurse with more than 40 years of experience in hospital nursing and 22 years in infection prevention and control. In addition to her role as project manager in the infection control department at Massachusetts General Hospital, Paula is the primary member of the infection control team responsible for participating in pre-construction risk assessment activities for new construction, as well as reviewing and approving all infection control risk mitigation assessment plans for construction and renovation projects. Paula has been a member of FGI's Health Guidelines Revision Committee since 2010. Welcome Paula and Byron, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for that introduction, Heather. In this first section, Getting Started, we will review the process that is used when planning for and designing spaces in healthcare facilities, and specifically when designing a sterile processing area. This slide asks the question, what is an infection control risk assessment, or ECRA? For the 2018 FGI guidelines, the infection control risk assessment is a documented process to proactively identify and plan safe design elements including consideration of long-range infection prevention. The guidelines further note that for a hospital project to support safe design, HVAC and plumbing systems, and surface and furnishing material selections, an infection control risk assessment shall be part of an integrated facility planning, design, construction, and commissioning activities, and shall be incorporated into the safety risk assessment. But what does this mean in a practical sense? First, it is important to understand there are two components of the ICRA process. The ICRA process most are familiar with is the process for determining the risk mitigation measures to be implemented during the active phase of a project. These risk mitigation measures are intended to protect active patient care spaces from dust and to protect HVAC and water systems. This is a critical part of the ICRA process, however, it is not the focus of today's webinar. The second component of the risk assessment process, sometimes referred to as pre-construction risk assessment, is completed during the planning phase of the project and focuses on design. In this process, a multidisciplinary team, including users, infection control, and facilities engineering, among others, is assembled to determine the function of the space to be built. For a sterile processing department, this would include understanding the scope of the reprocessing functions that will be included in the new space and discussion of all the physical elements necessary to, to design a safe space from both an infection control and a staff, staff safety perspective. Issues to be discussed as part of this process include 
the design of both the HVAC and plumbing systems, surfaces and furnishing material selections, along with equipment that will be needed. As noted on the prior slide, in order to design a sterile processing area, one needs to understand the functions that will occur there. The first question to ask is, are you designing a full service sterile processing department for a hospital or a satellite sterile processing area within the operating room semi-restricted area? Other possibilities include a sterilization area for an outpatient dental practice or small clinic that performs minor procedures and only processes single instruments or small kits. Determining the scope of the work is critical to planning and establishing requirements. There are many questions to be asked, such as those on the screen, like, what is the specific functionality of the space and the volume? Will there be sterilization only or sterilization and high-level disinfection? What methods will be used and what type of equipment? Additional questions to be included have to do with workflow. Questions such as, how do soiled instruments arrive? And then, how do they travel through the space? Also, are there instruments that require hand washing, or can they all go through a washer disinfector? Also, how do clean supplies arrive, and how are they unboxed and where? What equipment is needed? Items like special sinks or ultrasonic machines, and things like instrument air. Answering these questions in advance allows the designer to research the specific needs for the type of reprocessing that is planned and allows for better programming of the space. In addition to understanding what the intended function of the space will be, the overall goal for the design of the space should be clear to all members of the team so that all are working towards those same goals. The primary goals when creating a new sterile processing department, according to the Association for Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, or AMI, should be to facilitate effective and efficient instrument processing, keeping in mind that increasing efficiency at the expense of effectiveness is not an option. Stated plainly, Cleaning, decontamination, and sterilization or high-level disinfection of medical devices is a complex process that requires time and attention to detail, so that while efficiency is a reasonable goal, speedy reprocessing is not. Another goal will be to ensure the correct workflow, which is always from dirty to clean, a phrase that you will hear consistently throughout this presentation. Promoting personnel safety and process standardization are also goals. Since instrument processing is highly technical, standardization of workflow prevents errors such as missteps in the cleaning process. And finally, minimizing environmental contamination and protecting processed items from contamination is also a design goal. There are many resources available to identify best practices and publish recommendations for sterile processing design from professional societies such as AMI and AORN, which is the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses, and also facility design guidelines such as the FGI guidelines and ASHRAE 170. These are the resources that regulators such as CMS and the Joint Commission expect these spaces to be designed to, so using them should facilitate creating a space that is compliant. Design needs also vary by reprocessing location, thus it's important to understand the needs of these different spaces. Detailed on the slide are four different reprocessing location types, each with its own unique requirements. These include the sterile processing department or the main sterile processing department in the hospital, which usually supports instrument and device sterilization and high-level disinfection from multiple operating rooms and procedure rooms. It usually includes a dedicated area for storage of a large amount of sterilized goods. Thus, the sterile storage room in a sterile processing department has specific requirements for environmental controls, including specific HVAC parameters for pressurization, temperature, and relative humidity. And these are detailed in the HVAC standard ASHRAE 170, which can be found within the FGI guidelines. 
Another type of location is the satellite sterile processing department. This location, often within the surgical suite, also reprocesses critical equipment and thus must be functionally equivalent to the SPD in terms of ensuring consistent dirty to clean workflow. Office-based reprocessing and ambulatory care is, another, is a third type of location where sterilization is performed and is generally much small on a much smaller scale, thus requirements for this type of area are less stringent. Endoscopy and bronchoscopy processing areas, along with areas for processing endocavitary ultrasound probes, are the fourth type of processing location. These devices undergo high-level disinfection, which presents design challenges that are unique to the chemicals and equipment used for these procedures. There is not a one-size-fits-all approach to designing these various spaces. However, the basic principles of instrument and device reprocessing must be adhered to, to consistently across these spaces. So it is critical during the design phase to be clear about which processes will be performed in the space in order to develop a safe and compliant design. In the next section, Byron will provide an overview of the basic principles of reprocessing. Understanding the science behind these complex processes will help to underscore the importance of designing spaces that support best practice. Paula just described briefly the processes that occur in a sterile processing department. And now, as she said, I'm going into a little more detail. And I'm hoping that this will help you realize the whys behind all of the requirements. In summary, the requirements assist with successful and safe completion of a process called reprocessing. But what is reprocessing? The answer to that question comes in the next few slides. I'm going to start this discussion with a historical perspective. In this picture, you can see how reprocessing was done years ago. And some of the key points are that the person is taking a tray of instruments from an autoclave using a pot holder or something else to protect her hands from being burned. She appears to have gloves on, so we ask, are they sterile or not? Note the container is open and not wrapped. The person standing very close to her has no face mask on. And in fact, she's not even in scrubs and her hair is not covered. The nursing cap in the olden days doesn't count. Another thing to notice is the chamber of the sterilizer is very small and handles only one tray of instruments at a time. Seeing this raises the question, were the instruments in this picture sterile when they were removed from the sterilizer? The answer is actually yes at that moment, but not for very long. They rapidly become contaminated by the air and possibly by that person who is standing next to the one removing the instruments. And then there's always that crazy potholder. Now let's shift to the sterile processing department of today. As you can see, it looks very different from the previous slide. The first thing to notice in picture one is that the sterilizers look very different. They're much larger in size and of course in number. In pictures two and three, you will note that the sterilized instruments are all in covered containers. This covering helps to decrease the contamination that would occur during storage if they were stored in an open container. Picture four shows a person assembling a stringer of instruments in preparation for the sterilization. Note, this person is in scrubs and has on PPE. In picture five, note that these instrument trays are waiting to be wrapped prior to sterilization. Note the number of trays that are waiting and the space that is required for the cart they are sitting on. Mentioning space, note the amount of room in picture six being taken up by the rack for receiving instruments from the washer decontaminator. Also remember that sterile processing has not only grown in size, the processes that are performed in this area have grown in complexity. Now that you can see some of the changes from yesterday, let's give another definition for sterile processing department. This definition comes from the folks at AMI, the association that authors a large amount of the guidance for sterile processing. 
they define the sterile processing department or area as an area within a healthcare facility that processes and controls medical supplies, devices, and equipment. These devices are sterile and not sterile. They are for some or all of the patient care areas within the facility." End quote. All of the items reprocessed in a sterile processing department are reprocessed by either low-level disinfection, intermediate-level disinfection, high-level disinfection, or sterilization. All of these different methods of reprocessing have required design criteria that needs to be incorporated into the area. Also in many facilities, all of these methods will be performed in the same sterile processing department. Therefore, all of the criteria for each of the types of reprocessing that will be performed in the area must be included. Now for some other definitions. All of the disinfection processes and sterilization process start with cleaning, which is the removal of organic material and soil from objects. Cleaning is normally accomplished by manual or mechanical means using water with detergents for environmental services, surfaces, or enzymatic detergents for instruments and equipment. The first level of disinfection is low-level disinfection. This is a process that kills most bacteria as well as some viruses and fungi. Low-level disinfection will not kill tuberculosis bacilli or bacterial spores. The next level of disinfection is intermediate level disinfection. This process kills most bacteria, viruses, and fungi as well as the tuberculosis bacilli. Intermediate level disinfection will not kill bacterial spores. These two processes are chosen for items that touch only intact skin and not mucous membranes, or the item does not touch the client, patient, or resident directly. Items that are frequently low level disinfected include bedpans, and blood pressure cuffs. Now I will explain the difference between high-level disinfection and sterilization. High-level disinfection is defined as the process that deactivates all types of microorganisms with the exception of bacterial spores and prions. High-level disinfection can be used safely for devices that come into contact with but do not penetrate non-intact skin or mucous membranes. Equipment which is included in this category includes things such as scopes used for colonoscopies or EGDs. Sterilization, on the other hand, is defined as a process by which all microbial life, including pathogenic and non-pathogenic organisms and the spores are killed. Sterilization is the process of choice for items that enter either sterile tissue or the vascular system. This includes the vast majority of the instruments used in surgery. Sterilization is accomplished by various methods, including steam, hydrogen peroxide, ozone liquid chemical, ethylene oxide, and dry heat. All of these methods have separate design requirements. When designing a facility, the requirements for one or all of the methods must be incorporated into the design if they are using this method of sterilization. The reprocessing starts with cleaning, and the cleaning process actually starts in the OR or at the point of use in the form of pre-cleaning, which is basically wiping the gross debris off the instrument or maybe just putting the instruments in a basin of water or applying an enzymatic foam to keep the instruments moist. Then the instrument is brought to the decontamination room where it is washed, rinsed, and depending upon what type of instrument it is and the process it is going through, it may be rinsed again. 
The instrument can now be handled with bare hands and is now ready to be passed through to the clean workroom where it is prepared for packaging. Then after packaging, it is taken to the sterilizer and sterilized. And finally, it is taken to the storage area. One thing that is important is that the instrument or the person carrying the instrument should not go through clean spaces in route to decontamination area or vice versa. In the previous slide, I mentioned at a very high level the processes that occur in a decontamination room. Now I'll give you some more details. The first picture is the person performing decontamination. And as you can see, the person is wearing PPE as required for their own safety. This PPE can lead to the person becoming very warm because the fabric in the PPE is non-breathable. This is one of the reasons the recommendations for the temperature is as low as it is. The process, as I stated, starts with washing to remove the gross contamination. Then the item is rinsed once or twice, depending upon what it is. Then it may be placed into an ultrasonic cleaner, which helps to remove all of the very small debris and clean all the cracks and crevices. Next, it may be put into a washer sterilizer or washer disinfector. Frequently, this is the way the item goes from the decontamination room into the clean workroom. If the item will not tolerate this process, then it can be passed through a pass-through window or door. That's why you need those design requirements. The cleaning process is important because if it is not cleaned thoroughly, then the sterilizing agents will not be able to get to the surface and the item will come out of the sterilizer, but it will not be sterile. Now that the instrument is in the clean workroom, it is prepared for sterilization. The sterilization process starts with inspection for flaws, damage, debris, detergent residue, and cleanliness. This is followed by organization and wrapping or inserting into a rigid container. Then the item is placed in the sterilizer, processed by whatever sterilization method is appropriate, then removed and sent to storage. Storage may occur in the same room or a different room. And one thing to note in these pictures is the size of the cart of instruments the person is pushing. This cart of instruments is ready to go into the sterilizer. And when you compare that to the pan of instruments in the early slide, you can see why it truly needs more room than that of the earlier slide. The final step in the process is storage, which as I mentioned, can occur in the clean workroom or a different room. The sterile storage room is defined as a room designed to store clean and sterile items and to also protect them from contamination. We will discuss some of the other criteria for the sterile storage room shortly. But first I want to mention one other space that may be attached to the sterile storage area or be located some other place in the building, and that is a decasing or breakout area or space. This is an unpacking area or space where products are removed from their external shipping containers before being taken into the clean preparation and packaging area or into the sterile storage area. The reason they have to be removed from the external shipping container is that there may be vermin or other things in the external containers, and these things should not be in the semi-restricted or restricted areas of the surgical suite. Once the item is in the sterile storage, it is sterile until some event occurs, making it unsterile. These events may include something like a hole in the packaging material. Maybe the temperature and humidity go out of range. The item is roughly handled, causing some sort of break in the packaging, or maybe just the tape that holds the package together gets torn. The definition shown here of event-related sterility is from ANSI Amy ST79, the 2017 version. Now I'm going to turn it over to Paula to discuss workflow and some other key components related to sterile processing. 
In this next section, thank you, Byron. In this next section, we will focus on how design can support those best practices for correct workflow, packaging, and terminal sterilization of, or high-level disinfection of instruments and other devices. As Byron described, the steps for reprocessing instruments and devices begins with cleaning to remove soil, then decontamination to render the devices safe for handling, and then movement to whichever level of reprocessing is indicated for the device, either high-level disinfection or sterilization. Again, this workflow is referred to as dirty to clean. Dirty instruments arrive first at the decontamination area and then stepwise move to a clean area and then finally to reprocessing and storage. What is important for SPD design is ensuring that the physical environment supports that one-way traffic pattern from dirty to clean to prevent opportunities for cross-contamination. This can happen if staff carrying clean supplies or equipment have to move back through the decontamination area to get to the clean area. The graphic on this slide demonstrates one way to establish correct workflow with three separate rooms, one for decontamination, one for prep and pack, and one for sterilization. This workflow can also be accomplished with a two-room design with prep and pack and sterilization combined into one location. Containment of contaminated items during transport is also important to prevent contamination of the environment. For this reason, travel routes of dirty and clean instruments should be separated if possible. And soiled instruments must be transported in a closed cart or in containers that are clearly identified as soiled. Sterilized goods also need to be protected from contamination during transport, such as in closed uh, carts or closed containers. In the prep and pack area, the focus is on management of clean items, including inspecting instruments for residual bioburden, visualizing lumens, and ensuring dust and debris doesn't settle into packages before wrapping. These reasons, for these reasons, this space has specific lighting requirements and also requires positive pressure to keep the space clean. As noted previously, endoscope reprocessing is another function that may take place in the sterile processing department. Endoscopes are reprocessed by high-level disinfection. If endoscope reprocessing is to be included in the overall plan for the sterile processing department, it may be performed in either a dedicated area within the SPD or incorporated into the general SPD workflow as long as the workflow maintains that dirty to clean process and the surfaces and equipment specific to scope cleaning are provided. Scope reprocessing may also be performed in a dedicated space within the endoscopy procedural area. Design needs for endoscope reprocessing that are critical to infection control include adequate space to perform the eight processing steps in the correct order as listed on the slide. These include pre-cleaning, which may occur in the procedure room as part of the initial um, um, handling of the instruments, then leak testing, followed by manual cleaning, then flushing, rinsing, and drying, then it proceeds to high-level disinfection, usually an automatic endoscope reprocessor. Then drying again with forced air, and then finally placement in an appropriate storage cabinet. It's important that the surfaces in these spaces need to be smooth, durable, cleanable, and tolerate hospital-grade disinfectants. Specific requirements are detailed in the FTI guidelines. And some are listed here on this slide, such as monolithic floors with integral cove base wall and walls that are free of fissures and open joints or crevices that may retain or permit the passage of dirt particles. Some are listed here as others will be covered later in this presentation. Endocavitary ultrasound probes are another type of device that require high-level disinfection. 
Reprocessing of these devices is less complicated than endoscope reprocessing. They do not have lumens or moving components, and they are used with a cover, so are usually minimally contaminated. The size of the space dedicated to this function will be dictated by the method used for reprocessing and the volume of probes to be reprocessed. These devices can be reprocessed either via a soaking method, as seen in the pictures on the slides, or via a self-contained unit, as will be seen on the next slide. The reprocessing space must again allow for that dirty to clean workflow and there must be provision for storage of clean probes to protect them from contamination. This can be in the form of either covers or cabinets, but they should not be stored in the decontamination area. The basic requirements are listed and include a work counter, a sink appropriate to the method of decontamination, a dedicated hand washing sink, and space and utility connections to support the high-level disinfection process that, and equipment that are used. Some organizations may process ultrasound probes in a unit-based soiled workroom. If this is done, there needs to be an appropriate instrument cleaning sink, as it is not acceptable to wash devices in a hand washing sink or in a clinical flush room sink which are the two types of sinks that are standard fixtures usually placed in a soiled workroom. Designers and units should be clear on this point. If unit-based reprocessing is going to take place in a standard soiled workroom, an additional sink appropriate to instrument washing will be need to be added. On this slide, there is a picture of the self-contained unit that I referred to on the prior slide. This device allows for point-of-use processing of endocavitary probes. Probes are covered when in use, and thus after cover removal, there is generally minimal contamination. So it is acceptable to use a disinfecting wipe to clean the probe. Then the clean probe is placed into this unit, which completes a self-contained high-level disinfection cycle. This device does not require plumbing or special ventilation and has been approved solely for the disinfection of endocavitary ultrasound probes. These units, because they are self-contained, can be placed either in an ultrasound processing room or directly in an exam room where procedures are performed. When these units are placed in exam rooms, staff will still need access to a soiled workroom with an instrument sink in the event that a probe inadvertently becomes grossly contaminated and will require manual washing prior to placement in the disinfecting unit. Probes or any contaminated device should never be cleaned in an exam room or procedure room sink. That sink is, is uh, dedicated to hand washing and that space needs to be maintained clean and patient care ready. A final thought about planning for a new SPD. The FTI guidelines provide minimum design requirements for safe reprocessing, focusing on supporting a dirty to clean work, workflow through design of the physical environment. However, more specific requirements will be dictated by the program, what is being processed, and by what method and the equipment that will be used. Equipment purchased will dictate things like mechanical, electrical, and plumbing requirements, and of course, power and data needs. Now Byron will speak to sterile processing design with a focus on staff and patient safety. We here at AORN do a lot of research, and one of the key things that the literature tells us is that you cannot have patient safety without staff safety. So when designing a building, it needs to truly reflect both staff and patient safety. As I mentioned earlier, personnel protective equipment, AKA PPE, is worn in the decontamination room or area, and it includes all of the items listed here. One thing that is not considered PPE, interestingly enough, is the scrubs the person wears. The reason for this is the scrubs really do not protect you from bud, blood or body fluids that you may encounter in a decontamination room. 
One of the design criteria that needs to be considered here is the temperature and relative humidity. The temperature and relative humidity of the decontamination room of the sterile processing department is controlled to minimize potential growth of bacteria, fungi, and molds, and to provide a comfortable working environment for the person who is in the PPE. Protective attire worn in the decontamination area may be uncomfortable because it doesn't allow the body to disperse heat that is generated while working. Many of the protective gowns and aprons used in the decontamination area are made of plastic or some other fluid resistant materials. These materials provide an excellent barrier to bloodborne pathogens, but it does not allow for the body to disperse any excess heat that may be built up. This heat may cause the employee to sweat, which creates a very un uncomfortable condition and the person really should be able to feel comfortable while working. The general requirements for the sterile processing department used to be different based upon who you were using as a reference. I have good news though. The temperature, relative humidity, and the other HVAC parameters are now aligned across all the different organizations that publish guidelines on this. The AORN, AMI, ASHRAE, and FGI are just some of the guideline publishers. The HVAC design parameters established by ASHRAE and published by others for the sterile processing department are broken out into the three areas of the department as shown in this table. The requirements for the clean workroom in the sterile processing department are that it must have a positive pressure relationship to adjacent areas because this helps to keep any airborne contaminants out of the workroom. There must be a minimum of four total air exchanges with a minimum of two outdoor air exchanges and the air should not be recirculated by means of room units. The maximum relative humidity in this area is 60 percent and the design temperature is 68 to 73 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 to 23 degrees centigrade. There are no recommendations regarding the air being exhausted directly to the outdoors. Remember, this is for the clean side. And now in contrast, the requirements for the dirty or decontamination side are there must be a negative pressure relationship to adjacent areas. There has to be six minimum total air exchanges per hour and a minimum of two outdoor air exchanges. All room air may be exhausted directly to the outdoors and no air may be recirculated by means of room units. These settings may help keep any airborne contaminants that may be present on the items being decontaminated from being sent to other areas of the facility. The temperature range is broader in the decontamination area than the clean workroom because of the personnel component I mentioned earlier. This range is 60 to 73 degrees Fahrenheit or 16 to 23 degrees centigrade. And also there are no recommendations for the relative humidity. If there is a separate sterile storage area, the ASHRAE requirements are a positive pressure relationship to adjacent areas four minimum total air exchanges with two minimum outdoor air exchanges. The humidity maximum is 60% with a maximum temperature of 75 degrees. Note, no range here, just a max. There are no recommendations for exhausting the air directly to the outdoors or air recirculation by means of room units. These are the design criteria and are not really intended to be operational but frequently they are adopted to be the operational settings. This topic is very concerning for many people and they get really worried if any of these settings go out of range, even to the slightest degree. Well, what happens if the HVAC settings vary beyond the established range? Well, it's pretty simple. The facility will have to complete an assessment to determine what to do next. The results of this assessment may include anything from doing nothing to closing down the entire operation. 
the new ASHRAE 170 2017 edition, HVAC requirements for endoscopy suites shown here have also been standardized across the multiple organizations that publish this information. One thing I did forget when we were talking about commonality between all the different organizations is that the function of the space or the names of the space have also been standardized between all of the different naming organizations. The subject of monitoring HVAC systems is very broad. And when mentioned, people's mind frequently go to one or more questions, such as how is it to be done? Who is responsible for doing it? And when is it to be done? There is a requirement that the HVAC settings be monitored in the sterile processing department and it comes from the good old folks at CMS, AKA Medicare. Many people think that it is the Joint Commission or other accrediting agents that write this rule, but it is not. All of the agencies, such as the Joint Commission do in reality, is to enforce the CMS rules. It is interesting in that the rule only says that it must be done. It does not say how or when, or who needs to do it? The answer to the who, how, and when questions is a facility decision. And the key is that it is done. And if the system is not functioning properly, then the owner needs to document the action that is taken to resolve the situation. Also, interestingly enough, no other professional organizations, such as ASHRAE, AMI, or AORN, publish the answer to the question, who, when, or how. Here is a listing of the specific Joint Commission and CMS requirements that cover monitoring of the HVAC system. Similar language can also be found in the manuals from the other accrediting agencies. Sterile processing departments should be designed to decrease the potential for slips, trips, and falls. This is one of those big personnel situations. The first thing that comes to mind in this area is to have an adequate number and strategically placed electrical outlets, which helps to decrease the number of electrical cords that run on the floor. This is a trip hazard. There should also be adequate lighting so the person can see what they are doing and the lights need to be bright enough to see if there's any contamination on the equipment present during that inspection phase that I mentioned earlier. In this area, there is also a need to have an emergency eye wash station because the chemicals like those listed here in this slide are very corrosive and can cause damage to the eyes if splashing occurs and the chemical gets into the eyes. Now it is once again Paula's turn to speak about the changes in the 2018 FGI guidelines. Thank you, Byron. Um, and moving on to the changes in the 2018 FGI guidelines. In order to understand the changes in the 2018 guidelines, it helps to provide a little background on the history of sterile processing within the OR suite itself. In the 2010 and earlier versions of the FGI guidelines, there was a requirement for one substerile room between every two ORs for flash sterilization of instruments that may have been either in short supply or that may have been contaminated by being dropped on the floor. Ultimately, this practice was determined to not be safe uh, as Byron noted, uh, when you bring instruments out of an autoclave and open pans that are wet, they become contaminated fairly quickly. So this practice uh, by AORN was no longer endorsed uh, by AORN and other professional societies and was eliminated from practice. This eliminated the need for a substerile room. There was, however, still a need within the OR to be able to quickly sterilize instruments that were either in short supply or that had inadvertently become contaminated. So a rapid turnaround method for sterilization that includes all the required steps and is completed in a closed protective container 
was developed, and this is referred to now as immediate use sterilization. This new approach to rapid turnaround necessitated the creation of a satellite sterile processing area within the surgical suite. To respond to this need in, two, in the 2014 edition of the guidelines, the concept of a satellite sterile processing room was introduced. The minimum requirement for this room at the time was a one-room design, with a two-room design being optional. The concept at the time was that either configuration would have a one-way traffic flow, enabling an instrument to go from dirty to clean without risk for cross-contamination. However, we soon learned that there was no way to ensure that air flowed from clean to dirty in the one-room configuration or to ensure that staff maintained the correct workflow procedure. As a result, for the 2018 edition, the Infection Preventionist on the Healthcare Guidelines Revision Committee and other subject matter experts took a second look at this change with an eye to supporting the development of sterile processing facilities that encourage clinical personnel to comply with professional practice guidelines for cleaning, decontaminating, and sterilizing surgical instruments. Considering the importance of maintaining that dirty to clean workflow in sterile processing areas, it was determined that the minimum requirement for these spaces is two rooms, consisting of first a decontamination room and a clean workroom, thus, re establishing, thus establishing a requirement for a minimum of two rooms for a satellite sterile processing area or for any sterile processing area for that matter. And this is what is now required in the 2018 guidelines as it allows for that one-way traffic flow to prevent dirty instruments from passing clean instruments. This graphic visually depicts the expectations of a satellite sterile processing area in the surgical suite. In essence, it must be functionally equivalent to the main SPD with separate decontamination and clean rooms that are physically separated by a wall that contains either a door or a pass-through that can be secured. Another option is, as, as Byron had demonstrated on earlier slides, uh, built-in washer disinfector, disinfector with a pass-through option. This drawing is an example of what a two-room sterile processing room might look like in a surgical suite. The red arrows indicate soiled instruments being brought from an operating room into the decontamination side via the semi-restricted corridor. Instruments then move through decontamination onto the clean side where they are sterilized, and then the green arrow demonstrates the instruments leaving the clean side into what is often referred to as sterile core, and then back into an operating room where the instruments are needed. This could be the same operating room where the instruments came from if it was something that was dropped during the case, or it may be going to a different OR where there is a particular type of instrument set that is needed for the next case, in the case of specialty instruments that are in short supply. As with all rules, there are exceptions. So there is an exception to the two-room minimum for a sterile processing department. In making the change requiring a minimum of two rooms, it was recognized by the subject matter experts that there are some circumstances where minimal reprocessing and sterilization of small sets of instruments can be done safely in a single room. So for facilities where small countertop sterilizers are used for a limited workflow, such as in a dental practice um, or an out other outpatient practice, a one-room sterile processing facility is permitted as an exception. Per the guidelines, a one-room sterile processing facility shall consist of a decontamination area and a clean work area. So you still want to make sure that you keep these spaces separate. Another option is locating the clean work area in a dedicated alcove or in a clean workroom, such that in, uh, provided that instrument decontamination takes place in an appropriately designed and readily accessible soiled workroom. 
Thus, there are different options for configuring how reprocessing is completed in small practices and outpatient locations. This graphic depicts one of the two options for the design of a one-room sterile processing area. This design was developed by Amy and is included in their steam sterilization standard known as ST79. This design would be appropriate for reprocessing in an office-based practice. The red to blue to green arrows represents the changes in the status of the instruments from soiled to decontaminated to sterile as they move through the process. Here are two design options provided in the guidelines for a one-room sterile processing room with specifics on where to locate the doors to allow for a one-way workflow. The first option allows for one door located approximately equidistant from the clean and decontamination side. Always this has to be in the conditions that it allows for one-way traffic. This scenario, however, will require clear procedures for how staff will behave in the space and close supervision to ensure that staff follow the correct workflow. The second option provides for two doors at or near the ends of both the clean and decontamination areas, again allowing for a soiled entrance and a clean exit maintaining that dirty to clean workflow. In both options, a four-foot separation must be maintained from the dirty sink to the clean surfaces where clean instruments are prepared. And this is to prevent splash contamination from the dirty sink onto the clean work area. This slide provides details on the minimum physical requirements for a two-room sterile processing department. For the decontamination room, note the sink requirements, which include a separate hand-washing sink, a three-basin sink for instrument cleaning and flushing, and a flush room sink or other provisions for waste disposal. This may seem excessive in terms of having this many sinks in a location, however, Keeping hand washing, instrument cleaning, and waste disposal as separate functions is critical to preventing cross-contamination during that instrument cleaning process. On the clean workroom list, note that the instrument air is necessary to dry instrument lumens. This can either be piped in or provided by portable tanks. Again, there must be a hand washing sink for this area as staff may need to wash their hands prior to prepping clean items for sterilization. On this slide, the details of the physical requirements for a one-room sterile processing department are listed. It includes many of the same requirements as a two-room SPD, with the exception of the allowance for a two-basin sink. The two-basin sink is the minimum in this location, due to the less complex instruments and sets that would be expected to be reprocessed in this type of practice area. Again, it is important to notice the distance between the instrument sink and the clean prep and pack area. Specifically, the instrument washing sink must be separated from the clean work area by a four foot distance from the edge of the sink or a four foot separating wall or screen above the sink rim because we know from experience that water splashes and can travel, and we want to maintain those clean prep and pack areas uh, clean and uncontaminated. In addition to the actual reprocessing spaces, there are other areas that are necessary to support the work of processing instruments and other medical devices. Uh, as Byron mentioned earlier, Thing, items need to be uncased, and we don't want cardboard shipping containers in our clean uh, areas. So these elements are required for both a one-room and two-room sterile processing. There must be adequate storage space for additional equipment and the considerable amounts of supplies that are associated with reprocessing. These support spaces are often overlooked when planning sterile processing, and the result can be that inappropriate storage of equipment and supplies in, in boxes stacked on pallets or even on the floor in hallways or even in offices. So these are very important needs to consider. 
Another important consideration is whether there is a vendor program. And if so, there needs to be space designated for drop-off and pickup of loaner instruments. This space should be separated from the sterile processing area. Another way that sterile processing may be handled by some programs or facilities is that instruments are sent off-site for sterile processing. If this is the arrangement that you are planning for, it is critical to have a space where initial rinsing and pre-cleaning can be safely performed to prevent bio-burden from hardening on the surface of instruments. This makes it hard to clean and sterilize them, as noted by Byron earlier in the presentation. In this circumstance, the guidelines require a soiled workroom with an instrument washing sink for this need. The instruments can not be washed or rinsed in a hand washing sink or in a clinical flush rinse sink, so a soiled workroom designated for this function must have an instrument sink for this purpose. There also needs to be shelves or racks for collecting containers with soiled instruments ready for transport. Soiled instruments awaiting pickup need to be held in a soiled workroom or soiled holding room with appropriate negative airflow to contain contamination. The room and the shelving slash racks need to be sized to accommodate the volume of instruments that are going to be collected over the course of the day or whatever time period the instrument pickup is. Other necessary support space for an off-site processing program includes a room for receiving and unpacking of clean and sterile supplies so they can be removed from external cardboard shipping containers. These items are then moved to a designated clean supply room. Now, moving on to endoscope processing room changes. So general changes to endoscope processing room in 2018 are highlighted on the slide in red. These changes are consistent with the changes made to SPD requirements in that they reinforce the need for the workflow to go from dirty to clean. The guidelines acknowledge that endoscope reprocessing may occur in the same location as sterilization and that if this is the case, then the requirements for sterile processing must be met. Also new in 2018, the guidelines require that the endoscope processing room meets the requirements of a semi-restricted area. The updated language also specifies how the reprocessing space may be accessed from the procedure room and also how the procedure room may be accessed directly from the clean workroom. This should not be interpreted to mean that traffic can flow back from the decontamination side into the, the procedure side. This allows for the soil scopes to exit into the reprocessing room, then travel over to the clean side, and then come back clean through into the procedure room uh, through a clean door. Also, there is a minimum clearance between soiled and clean areas in this location, which was left unchanged from the 2014 guidelines and is listed as three feet. Now, you may note that there's a difference between sterile processing uh, separation between sinks uh, and the clean area is four feet. Um, uh, I think that, in fact, this is left over from the 2014 guideline, um, and while there's no uh, specific scientific literature on how far um, in, uh, splash goes, uh, three to four feet is generally what is referred to, um, and for endoscope reprocessing area, three feet is what is currently in the guidelines. And in this final slide, list the updated requirements in red for the decontamination and clean areas of an endoscope processing room. It should be noted that there is not a mandate for a two-room design for an endoscope processing room. As long as the clean and soiled areas are functionally separate and the clean areas are separated from sinks by at least three feet, then one room is acceptable, though most would consider two rooms a best practice. In addition, scope storage cabinets must be located on the clean side and staff cannot cross through the decontamination area to access clean scopes. Another change in 2018 is that updated guidance on required sinks has been provided with a two basin sink as a minimum requirement. An exception to this would be if there was a valid alternate method used 
for both scope leak testing and pre-cleaning. In that case, a single basin sink would be acceptable. A hand washing station was also added as a requirement for the clean area. Again, the goal is to prevent staff travel backwards from the clean to dirty area to access a hand washing sink. In this final slide, list the updated In summary, design of sterile processing and endoscope processing facilities is complex and can vary depending on the size and scope of the program. These spaces are designed to support best practices for device reprocessing, including the design of the physical space to encourage correct workflow and HVAC design to both contain contaminants in soil spaces and protect clean and sterile supplies in clean spaces. Optimal design requires input from a multidisciplinary team, including SPD staff, infection prevention, and engineering. This is best accomplished as part of the infection control risk assessment process that should be conducted during the planning phase of construction. Thank you. Byron and Paula, thank you so much for that informative presentation on sterile processing department design requirements. Now, I have a few follow-up questions for you. First question, is there a preferred design for a one-room sterile processing department in terms of having one door or two? Well, um, I don't think that there is a preferred design. Um, in my personal opinion, the one door uh, equidistant that it relies on staff following policies and procedures to enter, turn left, go from decontam over to clean, and then exit um, on the clean, uh, coming around the clean side, is very difficult to ensure. And the two room, does, the two door uh, option, which allows for someone to enter with soiled equipment, proceed to clean, and exit through another door. Um, is one that operationally is probably easier to assure that staff will follow procedure. Byron, do you have anything to add to that? I think you summed that up very well, Paula. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next question. It was mentioned that ultrasound probes can be reprocessed in an exam room. Does that mean that they can be reprocessed by the soaking method in an exam room? So I think that's a very important distinction to make. Um, the only time that reprocessing an endocavitary ultrasound probe can be done in an exam room is if it's done in a self-contained unit. And it's done on a probe that is not grossly contaminated, that has been used with a cover, that was able to be effectively wiped clean with a disinfectant wipe prior to being placed in that self-contained unit. If a location is soaking in chemical for high-level disinfection, then that endocavitary ultrasound probe needs to be transported from the exam room to an appropriate soiled workroom for that type of reprocessing. And with that uh, appropriate soiled workroom, there would need to be things such as uh, potentially the need for a um, system where the air is filtered and um, or a containment device and everything like this. So yes, they definitely should be done in a sterile processing uh, designated area. Right, and I, I think um, when you're talking about the filtration system, you're talking about um, containing the fumes of those chemicals in the soaking containers. Absolutely correct. Okay, thanks for that. I noticed that there's no requirement for either positive or negative pressure in a GI endoscopy procedure room. There was at one time. Why is there no requirement now? Well, that's sort of an interesting story. Um, it, it predates my time on the uh, the HGRC, but I'm told that at one point it was positive pressure requirement, and at one time it was negative pressure requirement. And I think what it comes down to is GI endoscopy um, is not a sterile procedure. It's a natural orifice procedure. Um, thus, the need for positive pressure to maintain sterile fields uh, is not the same as in an operating room. Um, in addition, even though it is GI, 
there are not huge amounts of contaminants or aerosolized contaminants that are generated uh, in GI endoscopy, therefore no requirement for negative pressure. Um, so I think the uh, FGI and HGR, uh, HGRC uh, and ASHRAE uh, finally came to agreements that there really is no requirement or specific requirement for GI endoscopy. Um, pulmonary bronchoscopy is a different situation where there's potential for aerosolized uh, airborne uh, tuberculosis, so that would require negative pressure. Is something sterile if it's been high-level disinfected? Actually, no, it is not sterile. And I know there's a lot of uh, confusion out there regarding the separation of these two. The exception with um, high-level disinfection, as I mentioned, it only kills bacterial, it does not kill bacterial spores and prions, where the sterilization process does kill both the spores and uh, an enhanced sterilization process will actually kill the prions also. Do you have anything to add to that, Paula? Um, uh, no, I think that, that covers it. I mean, sterilization is for instruments that are going, as you, as you indicated earlier, into sterile body cavities or the sterile vascular system. So you don't want to have any um, live microbial life and spores, um, certainly if introduced into sterile body cavities, could germinate and cause infection. So sterile is for sterile body cavities. High-level disinfection is for contact with mucous membrane, um, which can tolerate those spores. Okay. Does every facility need a satellite sterile processing area within the surgical suite? No, actually they do not. They, if the, ster if the immediate use sterilization process can be accomplished in the sterile processing department, they definitely do not need a satellite area in, within the surgical suite. The surgical suite um, satellite processing enables a lot faster processing if your sterile processing department is way down the hall or something like this. I did consult one time with a 13 bed or 13 OR area and they had none because their sterile processing department was immediately below and they had a very good and very fast pro system to get the instrument down there, get it processed and get it back. And with the use of covered containers, there truly did not need to be a sterile processing, satellite sterile processing area within the OR. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. The presentation showed an example of a three room sterile processing department. Is that considered to be a best practice? Um, I think that was, that was just one example um, I think that it's a good practice, um, but I think that you can also uh, accomplish and achieve uh, best practice with a uh, two-room. So I don't, I don't want that to be taken as a requirement. I think that is an option. And again, it really depends on the volume of instruments, the types of instruments, and the processes that are going to occur. Um, three rooms may be much more efficient, um, but it's, uh, it's not was not meant to be. Uh, communicated as a best practice. That's all the time we have today for Q&A. Please remember to see the person who registered your site at the close of this session for information on receiving learning units or certificate. You must be registered through MADCAD to take the survey and obtain credit. Here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction documents. We hope you'll be able to join us for each presentation. Keep current with what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the 2022 revision cycle by signing up for our quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or following us on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to our presenters, Byron Burlingame and Paula Wright. Have a great day, everyone.